We are picking up on page 19 of the PDF, uh, starting around um, 555, I guess. <clears throat> Antigone says to Crayon, what more do you want than my arrest and execution? Nothing. Then I have it all. Okay? So once you're arrested and dead, I'll be happy. Back in Oedipus the King, Oedipus and Crayon are kind of going back and forth. Um, around lines, starting around 690, 695. And Crayon asks on 697, what do you want? You want me banished? Oedipus, no, I want you dead. It's a nice parallel between that and this passage that we just, that I just read in uh, Antigone. What more do you want than my arrest and execution? Nothing, then I have it all. Antigone, then why delay? Your moralizing repels me. In other words, shut up and just do it. Every word you say, pray God, it always will. That is, I pray to God that I will always be repelled by your moralizing. Give me glory. What greater glory could I win than to give my own brother a decent burial? And again, she emphasizes this. Because one of the tensions in the play you know, we, I had the stuff up here the other day about the state and the individual, a bunch of different things. But there's also a tension within individuals. And within the character of Antigone, the tension is between her desire for personal glory and her desire to kind of die for a, I, I can't think of another way of putting it, a more morally righteous cause to bury her brother. So there's that tension. There's a tension we're going to see. It may not be apparent now, but it will become apparent later in Crayon between doing what is morally right and doing what he wants to do, which ultimately, it gets down to the exact same tension that we see in Antigone. Okay? So she says, these citizens here would agree, and she points to the chorus, they would praise me, too, if their lips weren't locked in fear. Lucky tyrants. And now she turns and points to Crayon, according to our stage directions. There aren't any of these stage directions in the, in the Greek text. Lucky tyrants, the perquisites of power. Ruthless power to do and say whatever pleases them. So notice what idea she's introduced and, and doesn't say much yet. It's going to be brought out later by Haman. They agree with me. Keep in mind, the chorus represents thieves. She's saying, these people would speak in my support if their lips weren't locked in fear. The only reason they keep their mouths shut is they're afraid of what's going to happen. Crayon, you alone, of all the people in deeds, see things that way. What's he mean? use a modern colloquial expression, she's out of the mainstream. Like politically out of the mainstream. What's the mainstream? Literally, what is this word? Or what does it mean? It's a stream, right? So a river. Water's flowing this direction. Everything in the stream is moving in the, that direction. If you're out of the mainstream, that means you're trying to go against the flow. And in doing so, what do you do to the smooth movement of the water? You create turbulence. You create difficulty. Okay? She says, they see it just that way, but defer to you and keep their tongues in leash. They agree, but they won't say anything. Aren't you ashamed to differ so from them? 
Aren't you ashamed not to be in the mainstream? What can you... I shouldn't go there. Yeah, well. What can you do today to kind of, you know... Throw somebody's life in turmoil. Especially a public person. What can you accuse that person of? It depends on the race and sex of a person. If it's male, what one word, or maybe two, can somebody, male or female, level against that person to cause society to question? Rape <laughs> or sexual abuse. The whole Me Too movement, whether whatever one thinks of it. Okay? It's all about, you know, improper relations between men and women, usually men in power versus, you know, women not in power. I mean, who's the poster child of the Me Too movement? It's not Donald Trump. It's not, it's Harvey Weinstein. And yet you can get on YouTube and you can look at the clips of pick every major actress. And they're praising Harvey Weinstein up one side and down the other. Why? Got them jobs. Okay? Going against that, okay, does what? Get you politically in trouble. Okay? That's what, why are you so different? Why aren't you, why aren't you saying what everybody else says? She says, I'm not ashamed. Not to honor my brother, my own flesh and blood. In other words, I would go against the mainstream. I would go against all of thieves, if it were to honor my brother. So Crayon says, okay, so I'm not going to win that argument. Or I'm not going to get her with that line of attack. So he's going to use another one. Wasn't it please a brother too? Right? The brother who was killed by the brother who was killed? <laughs> Wasn't he a brother? She said, yes. By the same mother, the same father. Then how can you render his enemy honors? How can you honor Polynices, a brother, who killed Ateocles, your other brother? They were enemies, she says. He will never testify that to that. Ateocles dead and buried. Why not? I mean, literally, he won't testify because he's dead and buried. Why else? Okay, in death there aren't what? Enemies. In death, you're both dead. dead. And there are, there are examples from Greek literature of people who visit the underworld, Hades, and, and you see former enemies side by side, just bored out of their minds because there's nothing to do. But they're, they're not trying to kill each other. Why? Because there's no point to it. So your only enemies up here when something is at stake. And if nothing else, that something is taken out. And the idea of enemies, state, locale, nationality, all those kinds of things, you know, we fight for and defend up here. Sophocles is saying, down there, they don't, they're nothing. Crayon, he will. That is, he will testify that. Okay? So they go back and forth. And Hermione, uh, not Hermione, Antigone says, 584, death longs for the same rights for all. No matter what side the person was on. That's why I told the story the other day of the Iliad. When Priam, king of Troy, comes to Achilles and begs for his son's body so that his son can be properly buried. Never the same for the patriot and the traitor. Never, Crayon says. Once an enemy, 
uh, Antigone responds, who on earth can say the ones below don't find this pure and uncorrupt? The, don't find this, not his decree, her actions. Who up here can say that the dead don't look at me and go, well done, good job. Crayon, never. Once an enemy, never a friend, not even after death. <coughs> How does he know that? What's the basis of, for his argument? He has none. Okay. I was born to, jo to join in love, not hate. That is my nature. That is, she's saying she was born with that. That's literally, that is my nature. That's what I was at birth. And he says, fine, go love down below with the dead. And that's, by the way, probably a bit of foreshadowing for how she's going to die. Because she's going to die how? In a cave down below. Okay? And then Crayon kind of gets to the crux of his point or his uh, anger, let's say. While I'm alive, no woman is going to lord it over me. I'm not going to take orders from a woman. His meaning comes in. And the court says, look, here's his meaning. Crayon accuses her of participating. And she says, yep, I did it. If only she consents, if she agrees, I'm guilty too. And No, no, you didn't help. You were unwilling. Okay. They go back and forth. Antigone doesn't let her share in the blame, we'll call it that at this point. Okay. She says again, you can't lay claim to what you never touch. My death will be enough. They go back and forth. Okay. Antigone tells her to save herself. 625 as many. No, no, denied my portion in your death, denied my part. You chose to live. I chose to die. And what Antigone is telling us there is, is what? Let me put it that way. You chose, to, how did Ismene chose, choose to live? by not helping bury Polynices. I chose to die. In other words, I knew, do this, this is the consequence. This is the result. And she's saying, by doing this, I knew what would happen because she doesn't do it in secret. She doesn't go out in the pitch black of night, you know, dressed like a ninja and sprinkle. She does it in broad daylight, okay? Your wisdom appealed to one world, Antigone says, mine another. Well, what are the two wisdoms then? So here's life, and here's the dead. Your wisdom appealed to one world, the world of the living. The world of the living's wisdom says what? What's the most important value? that Antigone is saying is many believes. Louder? The law. the law? What happens if you obey the law? Stay alive. You stay alive. Living. That's the most important value. Nothing worth dying for. Okay? The wisdom below, she's suggesting is what? No. You follow the gods. You follow those unwritten, unshakable traditions of the gods, no matter where they lead. You followed yours, I followed mine. As many, yeah, but we're both guilty. No, you're not. <laughs> Live your life. I gave myself to death long ago, so I might serve the dead. Crayon, they're both mad. Not angry. Crazy, insane, out of their minds. 
One's just shown it. The other's been that way since she was born. Which is the one that has just shown her newfound madness? Is Manny. The other one's been crazy since birth. And yet, what are we going to be told within a couple pages? The one who's been crazy since birth, Crayon's words, is about to marry his son. I don't know about you. I've got two sons, two daughters. Eldest daughter's married. I don't want either of the rest, of, any of the rest of my kids, to marry a crazy person. I would probably do everything in my power to stop them. I mean, if I thought they were certifiably crazy, like they came in the house and started talking to the wall, I'd say, uh, no, no, just shepherd that person out and leave them alone. Okay. <clears throat> As Manny says, you're right, my king, since we're born with cannot last forever. Kind of implies, you know, you lose a little marbles the older you get, etc. He says, she says, commit cruelty on a person long enough and the mind begins to go. Line 635 and following. What has this Manny really just said? Why, why has she just shown her madness? It's his cruelty on a person long enough that has caused her to kind of do this. Crayon, yours did, that is, your mind went, when? When you chose to commit crimes with her. Notice he doesn't comment on, and maybe he doesn't get her little dick. It's your cruelty that has brought us to this point. What's his cruelty? By not allowing proper burial rites. Crayon, don't even talk about her, that is Antigone. Ismene, you'd kill your son's bride. They're not married yet. Bride to be, if you want. Okay? Yeah. There are other fields for him to plow, and there's lots of women out there. Yeah, but not as close a bond as theirs. In other words, their marriage wasn't a marriage of convenience. It wasn't a marriage of political diplomacy. She's saying what about Antigone in Haman, her fiancé? This is real love, which is kind of awkward, you know, talking about 4th century or 5th century B.C. A worthless woman for my son? Manny, dearest Haman, your father wrongs you too. He's not in the room. That, by the way, when you speak to somebody who's not there, there's a word for it, but we think the word applies totally to something else. It's called an apostrophe. It means when you're addressing someone who isn't physically in that place. It's in your book. Um, so, he says, stop, stop. You and your talk, you're really going to kill her. You're going to rob your son of Antigone. Death will do it for me. Death will break the marriage off. In other words, if you're not on my hands, leader. So it's settled then? Notice that's a question. <coughs> Antigone must die? That's a question. Why is the leader raising two questions? What's the leader giving crayon? And out, big enough out to drive a dump truck through. Settled? Yes, we both know that. Shut up. Smack them. You know. Stop wasting time, he says to the guards. Take them in. So as many in uh, Antigone are taken into the palace. And the chorus gets a speech. Long speech, and you got a bunch of footnotes. Blessed. They are the truly blessed who all their lives have never tasted devastation. Who are those? No one. No one, thank you. Who has never tasted devastation in their lives? Devastation doesn't have to mean total annihilation and ruin. It's the bad crap that happens daily. That at the time, you know, you got... Big piles of crap, you know, dinosaur level, and 
little cat piles of crap level in one's lives. It, at the time, even the little small stuff can seem devastating. So, blessed they are the truly blessed who live all their lives, who all their lives have never tasted devastation. For others, for us poor slobs in the real world, the gods have rocked the house to its foundations. The ruin will never cease, cresting on and on from one generation on throughout the race, like a great mounting tide, blah, 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 blah. And this often happens in Greek tragedy and in other places in Greek literature where you see the gods strike a house, the ancestors of that house, and what happens? Those problems ripple on down through the generations. I mean, think of what I said when we were reading Nathaniel Hawthorne's Minister's Black Veil. An awful lot of Hawthorne stuff is really dark. And that's because he felt a sense of personal guilt because of his ancestors burning witches and Quakers, by the way. Not just witches, people of different religious ideologies, all right? So the chorus goes on and talks about the sorrows of the house, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then Haman comes in. Well, now here's Haman, the last of all your sons. Does he come in tears for his bride, his doomed bride, Antigone? So that is telling us, Crayon had more sons. The others are all dead. Is he bitter at being cheated of their marriage? The chorus is kind of setting us, the audience, up. Is Haman going to come in breathing fire and brimstone at his father? Crayon, we'll soon know, better than seers can tell us. Right? Because Sears, he's implying, like Oedipus did before him. Notice, he's got the kingship now. Who's he acting like? Oedipus. It's like there's something, something with the throne. Like power goes to people's heads. It makes them do crazy, stupid stuff. So he turns to Haman, Crayon does. Son, you've heard the final verdict on your bride. It's a nice way of saying, your wife's got to die, or your fiancé's got to die. Are you going to come now and rave against me, or do you love me? No matter what I do. How would that speech be different if it just finished? Are you coming now raving against your father, or do you love me? What is the no matter what I do add to that, or do you love me? What's it imply? Okay. What else? No matter what I do, it means what? Anything. I can do anything. And it, it, it's not meant positively. And will you still love me? If I kill everybody in Thebes, will you still love me because I'm your father? I don't know about you. I think most people go, no, Dad. <laughs> no, you're like, you know, flipping Abner Snopes. You're, no. <laughs> I'm your son. Pause. In your wisdom, you set my bearings for me. I obey. What does that mean, he set his bearings? I've got like a road right here, except for this bump. I've got like a road right here. These on either side are my bearings. They keep me from going out of the lane. You set what? My guidelines, my boundaries for me. No marriage could ever mean more to me than you. Whatever good direction you may offer. So... If you're thinking of getting married, if you're engaged, something like that, and your affianced, your intended, says something like that, run away as fast as you can. Because what is that person saying? Hey, your father will always be about Yeah, mama or daddy's always coming first. Daddy. I mean, in this case, it's daddy. 
no marriage can last <laughs> in that kind of situation. Crayon, <laughs> way to go, son. You know, that's how you ought to feel. Subordinate to your father's will in every way. For how long? I mean, till dad's 80 and I'm 60? Okay. There's an important context here. What is Crayon and what is Haman? What's Crayon's role in society? See, different context than the context of our mind. I don't know, maybe one of you is secretly a king and you're going to reveal yourself later or queen or something like that. What do kings and queens and princes and princesses have upon them that we don't? There are certain expectations, certain obligations, and certain responsibilities that none of us will ever live with. Used to be princes couldn't choose their own brides. Princesses, sure as hell, couldn't choose their husbands, whose approval had to be gotten, kings or queens, the kings or the queens. The current king of England, it's still hard for me to say that, the current king of England, King Charles, not Prince Charles, because he was prince forever, did not get initially to marry the love of his life. Instead, he married Diana, who was not the love of his life. The love of his life is the one he's now married to. And she was his love back then, when, if I remember correctly, she was married to somebody else, which would have made marrying her a little bit difficult. <laughs> David didn't have a problem. King David, Old Testament, didn't have a problem. He just sent her husband off to the front lines of the war and had him killed, and then he married her, okay? He had, Prince Charles, had to get the queen's approval to marry Diana. And he could only marry Diana because she was determined to have royal blood. Going way, way, way back. The Spencer line. Okay? That's kind of what he's, I think what he's getting at here. That's how you, son, prince, future king, ought to react to me. Prince Charles when his father, Prince Philip, and his mother, Queen Elizabeth, were both still alive together, let's say 1980s, 1990s, he couldn't do whatever he wanted in his life. What current prince, ex-prince, whatever, is in this boat? Harry. Okay? Because he's not acting very princely either, you know, all that kind of stuff. So... That's what a man prays for, to produce good sons, a household full of them, dutiful and attentive, blah, blah, blah. Okay? So he says to Haman, 723, and I think it's interesting when he says this, his wife isn't on the stage. Because I can guarantee you, if I said this to one of my sons and my wife was on the stage, she'd be walking over to me and slapping me every which way. Haman, never lose your sense of judgment over a woman. The warmth, the rush of pleasure, it all goes cold in your arms. I warn you, a worthless woman in your house, a misery in your bed. Now that could also be part of the ancient Greek homosexual thing. You know, you only have women in your bed to reproduce Otherwise, you curl up with a man. Okay? Could be that. What wound cuts deeper than a loved one turned against you? Spit. Notice it. No. Spit her out. Who's the loved one? A woman. Like a mortal enemy. Ah, now he makes it clear. Let the girl go. Forget about Antigone. I'll get you another Antigone. We'll call her Antigone too, you know. We'll be like Hollywood. Let her find a husband down among the dead. 
And then he says, I caught her in naked rebellion. She wasn't naked. Her rebellion was naked. It wasn't hidden. It wasn't covered up. It wasn't a conspiracy. She did it in broad daylight. Okay? So he says, think what I'd suffer from the world at large, 739. Show me the man who rules his household well, and I'll show you someone fit to rule the state. He's saying, if I can't control her, what will our enemies think of me? Pushover, right? So, he goes on and says, whoever steps out of line, whoever violates the laws, that person needs to be punished. That person needs to suffer. 752 or so. Anarchy. Show me a greater crime in all the earth. What is anarchy? Anarchy. Lawlessness. What else? Literally, and means against, un, not, the archy, order. Against order. Order can be laws. It can be political order, you know. Kings, queens, etc. get rid of them all. Go all Robespierre in the French Revolution. Just kill them all. What comes out of anarchy if it's not stopped? More anarchy. Chaos, not order. Cosmos, Greek word cosmos, means order. Chaos means no order. So, Notice how he describes anarchy. She. She. <clears throat> okay. Better to fall, 759. Better to fall from power if fall we must. At the hands of a man, never be rated inferior to a woman. Never. So why is he really going to kill Antigone? Because he can't look weak compared to a woman. That's it. I mean, I mentioned the other day the lines where, you know, he says that if he lets her win, she will essentially emasculate him. Leader, to us, unless old age has robbed us of our wits, okay, and that is a possibility. You seem to say what you have to say with sense. You seem to say. Why doesn't the leader of the chorus just say, to us, unless old age has robbed us of our wits, you say what you have to say with sense. You say what you said with sense, meaning with logic, with reason. It makes good sense. You seem to do that. Seem is a subjunctive verb. Subjunctive means it indicates a condition contrary to fact. He appears to say what he has to say with sense, but by throwing that seem or appears, it means he doesn't. It's like saying, and again, I don't care your politics. I can do this about every president if you want. It seems... Like Donald Trump is a very humble, modest person. Even Trump's most ardent supporters would say, no, no. It seems like Kim Kardashian is a wholesome, virtuous woman. No, I could put up here and prove it, <laughs> with both of them, that it's not true. Okay. So what's the leader saying? You're not saying everything you think you're saying. So Haman says, Father, only the gods endow a man with reason, the finest of all their gifts, a treasure. Far be it from me, I haven't the skill and certainly no desire to tell you when, if ever, you make a slip in speech. Though someone else might have a good suggestion. Hello, chorus, speak up. Why? Because they're the same age as Crayon. Haman's his son. He says, it's not, it's not your job 
to listen to the city. And he says, you know, the average man in the street, like a today, a man in the street interview, CNN puts the mic to the face, he'd never say anything. Displeasing to your face. What happens today if someone in Moscow, Russia, not Idaho, says Putin is an idiot and this war in Ukraine is totally destroying us? Well, there's been this strange illness that has hit Moscow. People have come out against Putin. They suffer from falling out of window disease. The latest one was somebody who worked in the military and she fell out of a 16th floor window. There's literally been about a dozen people in the last year, all kind of tied to Putin, and all who've kind of said, mm, not such a good idea. But, he says, so somebody in the street, an individual, will not say that publicly. But it's for me to catch the murmurs in the dark. What does it mean, catch murmurs in the dark? Like he goes to the bars. He sits in the back and he hears the conversation. And the conversation is, Crayon being an ass. Man, Antigone. She's got the biggest, brassiest, you know what, compared to Crayon. She is doing what the gods expect. No woman ever deserved death less than such a brutal death for such a glorious action. Glorious here doesn't mean earning glory for herself. Glorious here means righteous, right in the eyes of the gods. Death, she deserves a glowing crown of gold. That's what I hear, Father. That's what rumor spreads. So he says, I rejoice in your glory. But I'm telling you, whoever thinks that he alone possesses intelligence, 791, the gift of eloquence, he and no one else, and character too, that is, whoever thinks that he alone possesses intelligence, the gift of eloquence, and character, such men, I tell you, spread them open, that is, dissect them, not literally, metaphorically, and you will find that person empty. It's not a disgrace to learn many things and not be too rigid. What's that mean, to learn many things? If you can learn something, then what are you not? You're not all-knowing. That is... There may be some things you're ignorant, not knowing about. He's suggesting, Father, you are ignorant about the perceptions of the people. It's okay to learn. Because what can happen when you learn? What does happen when you learn? You change. You may not change your actions, but you change. Part of you develops. You know, we would say today, cognitive psychologists and neuroscientists and such, nerve, new nerves are created, new nerve endings, new synapses are created in the mind. So he goes on and he gives the analogy of a tree in a storm. A tree whose will is firm and unyielding gets blown over. Bend or break, line 801. That's it. Crayon used the almost the exact same analogy earlier when Antigone was introduced to him. Later, you do well, my lord, if he's speaking to the point, to learn from him. Why the if? Why not? You do well, my lord, he's speaking to the point. Because an if is a subjunctive. He may not be speaking to the point. It's up to you, king, to determine that. 
you might do well to learn from him. And you, my boy, from him. What has the speaker, the leader, just done? Here's a fence. One foot here and one foot here. I'm going to take both sides. Why? Because that way I'm not totally screwed. I may be partially, but... So, we're to be lectured, are we, by boys his age? We old men who have been through the grinder, you know, the, the experiences of life, we're going to let this kid teach us? Haman, only in what is right. But if I seem young, there it is again, that indicates what? I might look young, but up here, I'm not. Look less to my years and more to what I do. That is, my actions. Because we've already talked about it before. You can be young and wise. How do you become wise? What do you learn from? Experience. You don't, not this. Not books. Not classes. Experience. The hard knocks of life. You can be young and learn from those. And you can be old. Really old never learn a lick from them. Okay? I could talk historical characters and real characters. Is admiring rebels an achievement? Notice what he latches on to. Do. Do. He says, look, look at more what I do. Is admiring rebels an achievement? I don't ask you to admire treason. But... That's the sickness that's attacked her. She's treasonous. The whole city of Thebes denies it to a man. What kind of government? Well, I've got it written down. What kind of government do we have? Is it a democracy or is it a republic? It's a democratic republic. It's a democratic republic. Which of those words is not in the Pledge of Allegiance? Democracy is not there. And to the republic for which it stands. See, ancient Athens, at Sophocles' time, was a true, literal democracy. Each citizen, male, each citizen had a vote. And that vote counted in the Senate. We don't have that kind of democracy. We have a democratic republic. What's the difference? Republic, work of the people. So what do we do? We elect, like, let's say we're having university elections and every classroom gets an election. We would, from the 12 or 15 people in here, we would elect one person. And that person represents this group. Because imagine if we tried to have a real democracy with 330 million Americans, 250 million of which are voting age. We get even less done than we get done, you know, kind of a thing, okay? What's Haman's point? It's not, you know, 52% of the people are for you, like we've had the last several elections, 52 to 48, 52 to 46, something like that, 48 to 46. No, it's everybody. And is Thebes about to tell me how to rule? See? Not a democracy, not a republic, what? A monarchy, a tyrannical monarchy. Now who's talking like a child? What's Haman's kind of point? Or Sophocles' kind of point? Because again, Athens, where Sophocles is writing, is a democracy. Sparta, whom they're getting ready to fight, is not a democracy. Sparta's a monarchy. So we have two different systems of government, and, and this might be written a little bit, possibly I'm suggesting, as a forewarning. If we lose, this is the kind of government we're going to get. Okay? Now who's talking like a child? Am I to rule this land for others or myself? In our system, we would hope for others. We elect a president to rule for whom? Only the people that elected him? No. 
only for himself? Hmm. We could talk about presidents. It's no city at all owned by one man alone. What? No, it's not. Are you crazy? The city is the king's. That's the law. Imagine if we had a president get elected, and in that inaugural address, I think I used this example the other day, the president said, thank you for giving me the United States. It is mine. The United States of Biden, the United States of Trump, the United States of Obama, the United, pick your president, you know, the United States of go forward to whomever you want. What a splendid king you'd make of a desert island. You and you alone. Haman doesn't have to come out and say the city isn't yours. He just uses that metaphor. George Bush, the second, after 9-11, he gave a address to a um, joint session of Congress, September 20th. It's regarded as one of the best speeches in American history. I mean, literally. The guy who you know, often fumbled over his words. It's literally regarded as one of the best speeches in American history. But he said one really stupid thing in that speech. He said, you know, we're going to start this great war on terror, blah, 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 and we won't end until terror is wiped out. Really? I mean, like a kindergartner could tell you. Good luck with that. Why? I'm going to change your ages for a minute. They're both two years old. I put them in a little child playpen. I give them one drink or one toy. We have terror right there, folks. Because most two-year-olds, oh, let me share here. You play with no. me. No. No, they're going to go, give me mine. You know, little bastard. Give me a knife. You know, shake them through the. Crayon, he's fighting for her side. Haman, if you are a woman, yes. He's fighting on her side, the woman's side. Haman, if you are a woman, yes. Man, that is like a knife to the lungs. He's just said, okay, so you're saying I'm fighting for a woman? I'm fighting for you, Dad. What's that make, Dad? Makes a mess of Dad, <laughs> you know. <laughs> My concern is all for you. Look how Crant, see, I'm, I wasn't being facetious with the raising the voice and everything. You degenerate. What's a degenerate? To generate means to produce generations. He's saying, you've fallen away from your generacy. And it's almost, I'm not saying that it is, it's almost like he's saying, okay, so we'll play your little game. If you're saying I'm a woman, then how did we produce you? We, me, crayon, woman now, Eurydice, my wife, lesbian lover now. Yeah, you're degenerate then. Okay. So, they go back and forth. Haman tells him, you are doing wrong to justice. To protect my royal rights when you trample down the honors of the gods. See, even Haman is saying, Dad, think of Agamemnon, red carpet. No, you are stepping on the gods' toes. Right? They go back and forth. What you say is a blatant appeal for her, for you, and me, and the gods beneath the earth. In other words, I'm appealing for all of us. He's telling his father, I, I want to save your life. You do this, you'll never marry her, not while she's alive. Then she will die, and her death will kill another. He's not threatening Crayon. But Crayon thinks he is. Brazen threats? Who's Haman suggesting? Whose death will it be if Crayon, uh, whose death is Haman suggesting it will be if Crayon kills Antigone? His own. You kill my beloved, you kill me. Crayon thinks it's, he's accused, he's threatening him. What threat? 
combating your empty, mindless judgments with the word? If you weren't my father, I'd say you were insane. Notice, he did just say he's insane. Okay? Haman rushes out. When Crayon says, now you've done it. You're going to see her die. I'm Bring her in. We're going to kill her right now, right in front. So that, you know, slit her neck and the blood splurts out on Haman. He says, no, no, she will never die beside me. Don't delude yourself. Yeah, not true. Dramatic irony. You will never see me, never set eyes on my face again. Rage your heart out, rage your friends. Who can stand beside of you? And the leader's like, you know, kind of hot-headed and passionate, and he's young, and you don't know what young people will do when they're hot-headed and passionate. What other play did we see somebody, hot-headed and passionate, but not young, run into the palace? Oedipus the king, who was that? Yocasta, what happened to her? You gotta kill them both. The leader asks, well, no, not her. The one that wasn't killed. Okay. See? Crayon can't change. I won't kill his meaning. I'm kind and generous and loving. So how are you going to kill Antigone? He says, uh, we'll seal her up in a cave. Yeah, that's good. We'll put her in a cave, and we'll set out some rations, some food and water. So I won't kill her. I won't be guilty of her death. If the gods want to rescue her, the gods can. There let her pray to the one God she worships, death, or who, you know. And if she lives, then she was right. Okay? And of course, gets a long speech, and Antigone comes back in. He gives a speech. She says she goes to wed the Lord of the Dark Waters. And Tigny thinks of Naomi, some other Greek myths. You got speeches going back and forth between them. She prays to the father's gods. And then she says, that's it. Because they allude to Oedipus. And she says, the worst pain, the worst anguish, raking up the grief for father three times over for all the doom, blah, blah, blah. Okay? Chorus comes in. She tells him again, don't weep for me, no wedding song for me, etc., etc. Crayon, see, she's still. If we let her talk and only kill her when she's done talking, he says, we'll never get a killer. She's going to run out the clock, you know. Take her away, wall her up in the tomb. You have your orders. So she says. Still speaks, addresses her father, addresses her mother, addresses her brothers, etc. And then says, ah, da, 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 da. 10, 13. What law of the mighty gods have I transgressed? Why look to the heavens any more tormented as I am? That is, why should I pray to these gods who are going to let me be killed? Whom to call, what comrades now? Just think, my reverence only brands me for irreverence. Reverence for what? The great, unshakable, unwritten traditions of the gods? What irreverence? Laws of the state. Very well. If this is the pleasure of the gods, once I suffer, I will know that I was wrong. She says, fine. C'est la vie. That's life. When I'm dead, she'll know what? The truth whether I was right or wrong. And if I'm right, then I'll be blessed. But if these men are wrong, let them suffer nothing worse than they meet out to me. Meaning? <laughs> Kill them, gods! Still the same rough winds, the wild passion, etc. Crayon, take her away. Okay? Okay. And we'll stop there. We'll pick up top of 37, around 1029 on Wednesday. Today's Monday, right? Yeah. And we'll finish this. Got to finish it. Um, your fiction exam, wake up. Your fiction exam.